thing set up, uh, you know, usually, I don't know whether it is by design or default, I almost always end up getting this session immediately after lunch. So <laughs> I love that because it keeps me awake too, because I'm doing all the talking. So what I'll do is while this is coming up, uh, you know, I recollect uh, a story, uh, a conversation. It's actually a conversation. It has two stories in it, and I'll tell you both. So the story, the first story is something which I have used innumerable times whenever I speak to any kind of audience, be it my children, or be it my team members, or be it my peer level, or my senior management. The first story goes like this. There were two frogs. If anyone has heard me before, you might have, you might have heard, so pardon me for that, but nevertheless, it's an interesting anecdote. There were two frogs who were happily prancing about uh, in the park one day. And uh, there was a pot of buttermilk in one corner. Don't ask me why and how. Okay. So both the frogs, they fell into it suddenly as they were jumping around. So the first frog just did not know what to do. It was an unknown situation, an unknown surrounding. So the first frog just lay still, dazed, and drowned and died. The second frog was a survivor. Okay. So the second frog said, let me do what I know to do the best. I can keep flapping my feet, so I'll keep doing that, I'll keep doing that. And he went on doing that. And as he did that, a butter got churned out of the buttermilk, hard butter. Okay? So the second frog stepped onto that rock solid butter and went out and survived. So the story ends here, the first story. So this is about how the frog did what he knew best and survived. The second story is about a conversation between a father and a daughter. So the daughter apparently has heard this story. Maybe she was present uh, when I was telling this story to somebody that I know. So she went and asked her dad that, Dad, I have heard about you know, how people have to do what they know best to survive adversity. But what if even that fails? What if I'm able to survive for the moment, but I'm not able to sustain the, sur uh, the, uh, I mean, the survival? What do I do then? The father was a very simple chef. He was a chef. Okay? And all that he knew was cooking, kitchen, pots and pans. So he told his daughter that, let me take you to the kitchen, and I'll tell you, I'll explain this to you in a way that I know best. And it's a time-tested method. So he takes her to the kitchen, and he puts three pots of water on the burners, three pots. In one pot, he puts some potatoes. On the second pot, he puts some eggs. And in the third pot, he puts some coffee beans. And after a while, he tells his daughter, my little girl, just go and take a look at what's happened to those pots. So she comes back saying, the pot in which you put the potatoes, it was yuck. The potatoes had become really soft and gooey. The second pot in which you put the eggs, the eggs had turned really hard. But in the third pot, when I opened the third pot, the surroundings were completely different. The color had changed, and there was a very strong aroma which made me smile. So the father says, so this is what I would call innovation. Right? So it's not enough now in this competitive world for you to do what you're doing best and survive. You need to go a little beyond that, look out for the coffee beans in you, and try and do something so that the people around you will choose you and not your competitors. So that's what is called innovation. So with that, setting the context, let me move on to the topic. This is creating a culture of innovation. Does this advance? Yep. Let's start thinking. Now, there are too many words in this culture and innovation. So let's start defining bit by bit, and then we'll put all of them together. So what's culture? Culture is all about people, their experiences, their beliefs, their expressions, and their behavior. Okay? So it's a culmination of how people express themselves collectively and individually. So for simplicity, I've picked out 
three keywords for defining culture. What's innovation? Innovation is all about novel. That's the root word. It comes, comes from being novel. Boundaryless. The moment you start restricting yourself to certain framework or certain boundaries and barricades, innovation can get killed. So it's all about being boundaryless and it's about bringing ideas to the forefront. So let's take these three words, novel, boundaryless, and idea. So if we were to define what we are going to talk about in the next 20 odd minutes, it's about the culture of innovation. So if I have to put all these words together and create a statement to define the topic, it's nothing but getting people to believe and behave that thinking is boundaryless, thereby generating novel ideas. So first of all, what an organization has to do to become innovative is to be like the father of the girl in my story. First, get your people to believe and behave that ideas are boundaryless, that is thinking is boundaryless, and that's how ideas, new ideas are born. So that's the first thing probably that has to happen when a culture of innovation has to be there. Okay, what's happening here? Innovation is trying to enter into an organization. So, you know, we have a new workforce in the new workplace. There are some great ideas that are coming in and the person is very excited and wants to come up and implement those ideas. Typically, what's the reaction in a very typical organization? I come, right now I work for an engineering company. It's in the oil and gas space, a very, very, very traditional uh, and a conservative uh, industry. So what happens when you come with innovative ideas? Standardization. We believe in standardization. So these are the standards. Don't deviate from them. That's what has made us profits all these years, and we will live by that. Rationalization. What is a rational? You're coming up with new ideas. You say it will work. Where's the guarantee? Simplification. No, we don't want to make it complex. We don't believe in bringing technology into this space. Let's keep it simple. Our business is to excavate oil, drill oil, oil wells, that's it. So when innovation is trying to make its way into an organization, it's crying out loud that I'm here to try and make your processes better. Use me and your processes will be better standardized. Uh, you'd be able to find more rationalization and it could probably even be more simplified. So what happens to us is the first reaction to anything that's innovative is that of resistance. So as we stay with this thought, moving on. Now when it comes to creating a culture of innovation, what is it that's required to do? Normally people would say that any such initiative, any such novel idea has to be driven from the top. So the moment you say driving from the top, all we think of is a typical organization chart, right? The organization chart would have a leader from whom the initiative will come. It will get cascaded down through multiple levels. And then there will be people on the floor who are the doers. Are we going to see innovation like that? Maybe, maybe not. But is an organization chart or an organizational hierarchy, is it really required for innovation? My answer is no. Then what is it that's required for innovation to happen? What is it that's required for creating a culture of innovation? It is an organization chart, like this one, where there is no hierarchy. Okay? It's more a teamwork. Because an innovation, an organization that has a culture of innovation will have the organization which is made up of creative geniuses, innovation champions, and innovation leaders. Okay? There is no rule as to how this organization chart should look, who should be at the top and who should be at the bottom. Absolutely no such rule. That is why you see a wheel in the middle, which is actually signifying that all these three types of people need to work together to bring about innovation in the organization. Now let's take a look at what each of these people do. 
the creative geniuses are the people who seek insights, come up with new thoughts, develop ideas, make proposals of those ideas, create those prototypes, do the testing, and all of that. Now, who in our typical organization are the creative geniuses? It could be me, it could be you, it could be the managers, it could be the workmen on the floor, it could even be external people, it could be the customers, right? So a lot of organizations where customer feedback is sought in a very serious manner and, uh, you know, ideas are developed around it to come up with uh, better uh, uh, ideas, those are companies where innovation happens because the customers also, the, also play the role of being the creative geniuses. What is the role of the innovation champions in the organization? The innovation champions are the people who will ensure that there are no obstacles to the ideas that come from the creative geniuses. If there are obstacles, they will do all that they can to clear them. Right? So they will also be able to provide them with the right infrastructure that may be required. They will be able to help them with what is required to do the testing. They would be able to volunteer themselves as test samples and any of those, right? So the champions could be, again, anybody. Mostly it's people within the organization because they are the ones who are going to make the profit out of the innovation. So the champions are the biggest enablers of the innovation to happen. And what about the innovation leaders? The innovation leaders have to just sit back and relax. The first thing that innovation leaders have to do is not intrude, intervene, and block the innovation. As leaders, if each one of us is conscious that I'm not going to come in the way of the innovation, the, nothing can stop the innovation. Okay, in some slides uh, towards the end, you will see how those people also can become deterrents. So these are the three people, types of people in an organization where a culture of innovation has to be built. Okay, now this is where we will look at what some of the barriers and myths to innovation. I have faced some real life situations here where there were barriers in the form of who I thought were the innovation leaders. So uh, when I was very excited about a new idea, a new way of doing things, which is actually a paradigm shift in the industry that I was in one of my previous organizations, I was told that don't go and start a fight. You won't survive. With due respect to you, sir, I was told that you are not a soldier, so you are not taught how to fight. So I said, one doesn't need to be a soldier to fight because I know what's right, I know I'm accountable for what I'm doing. As long as I have it in me to believe that I run this company, I'm an employee here, but I'm also an entrepreneur here, it's okay, I can go and fight. So fighting for what is right and what's good for the organization, backed up with data, of course, that's in my DNA. I don't need to be a soldier to be trained to fight. You know? So that's when, when you show accountability, some of these barriers can be broken then and there. Another very interesting barrier is our business model doesn't allow this. Come up with an innovation, an innovative idea, and there will be leaders who will tell you that our business model doesn't allow this. No one has done this anywhere else in the world in our organization. And let's do what is time tested. Let's not experiment. That's the biggest barrier to innovation. So the creative geniuses will come up with ideas and sometimes when the leaders lack the innovative spirit in them, can pose such barriers. Then come the innovative champions. They have a major role to play. The innovative, innovation champions are the people who will mediate between those, these two. Okay? They will keep the leaders who lack innovation at bay and give the freedom to the geniuses to carry out, create a prototype, and demonstrate that it is valuable to the organization. So the innovation champions have a key role to play. There are other uh, barriers and myths as well where you know, a lot of organizations can have a very short-term focus. They may not be even looking at 
two years down the line. I've seen that happening sometimes. So when you come up with an innovative idea, they say, really don't need it. What's happening is happening, and this will keep us floating for the next uh, two years. This is like the frog in the story, the second frog. I know I'm best at what I'm doing. Let me do it even better. But I'll just do what I'm doing, so I'll survive. So the question is, the champions here will ask, will probably ask that, do you want to just survive? Or do you want to stay ahead of competition? Do you want to have that cutting edge in your business? That's the role that the champions have to play to create the culture. And of course, there's also this feeling that innovation is possible only in products. We are a service industry. What kind of innovation do you think we can do? Right? But if the Olas and the Ubers and the others who came up with servicing people, if they didn't think of innovation, all these startups wouldn't have grown. So it's not only about products. So these are other myths. And of course, the very famous resource and budget constraints. So all innovation is killed. Right? So what are the various uh, reasons as to why innovation uh, is looked at these days, the why is of innovation. Why do companies want to innovate? Why are we even talking about this topic in such a forum? Why is the HR fraternity getting into areas like, you know, going digital, uh, using a lot of technology in HR processes, coming up with innovative ideas, uh, looking at how our performance management system should look? Why are we doing all this? We keep hearing from the market about the emerging trends. We keep hearing that these companies are doing things differently. So they are attracting our people. So all those things, the market trends, the market intelligence is one. Another is user-based research. Uh, you know, when we normally take exit interviews, one of the things is, yes, it is to be done because we need to keep a track of why people are leaving. But there's, a, there's also a lot of analysis that happens after the exit interviews are taken. There's a, there's a, that's a lot of information for research. And uh, trends are drawn as to why people are leaving the organization. What is it that would have held them back? If we give a little more focus on why people are leaving and what would have held them back, and we bring that focus back to the table with some innovative ideas, that's probably one reason why innovation is now, we are talking about innovation. We're talking about user-based research. Futuristic thinking. A lot of us want to look at where we are five years down the line, 10 years down the line, 2050, and so on. There are organizations who talk about 2050. So future thinking. If you keep flapping your legs like the frog in the story, you will keep surviving the buttermilk episode. But what if it's not buttermilk? What if you fall into hot water? You have to learn to innovate. Just flapping your feet in hot water is not, probably not going to help. So adversities can change, market scenarios can change, situations can change. So if you're looking at long term, if you're looking at future trends, then you need to think about innovation. And last but not the least, one cannot escape technological advances. If we try to avoid using technology, to some extent we can. But I've also heard people in the same breath saying that, Technology is bad, we should only do our work. In the same breath, they will say that, why don't we go and use an automation for this? So one cannot escape the evolution of the industry, of the business. So if, if you refrain from uh, evolving, that's it. Like Jack Welch said, the uh, rate of change on the outside, if it is greater than the rate of change on the inside, then your end is in sight. So the similar thing was also said by Charles Darwin. So for evolution, one cannot escape. And therefore, we're talking about innovation. And there are other aspects, other reasons, as to, uh, like system failure. Okay? If systems don't work, you need to you know, do something better. There could be financial triggers, feedback, etc. Like you know, somebody spoke about glass door in the morning, so things like that. How does innovation happen? There are plenty of tools. Innovation itself has no barriers. But let's name a few. Open innovation. Open innovation is nothing but openly talking about what you want to do, partnering with experts for ideas on strategy and resources. Now, these experts could be outside the organization. They could be internal. They could be from your formal, informal network, so on and so forth. 
design thinking is a way of bringing in innovation. I'm a design thinking practitioner, and I have used design thinking uh, for developing an employee value proposition in the organization. Now, how design thinking helps is the basic aspect on which design thinking is built is on empathize, empathizing. That's the key step in design thinking. So the moment you start putting yourself in your employee's shoes and start thinking like them, start alter egoing them, then you're here to do something which is better for them because everyone wants to make their own lives easier. Right? So design thinking is one way in which innovation can be brought about. The third, third one is very simple, brainstorming. One of the friends here uh, attended uh, one of my panel discussions with, with another forum where we used a very simple technique of brainstorming. We brought in all ideas on the table, absolutely open, without any fear of rejection, by using a tool called affinity diagram. So if you want to bring about, you know, let people come up with innovative ideas, even in a small team meeting, you can use a technique like an affinity diagram, run that in your team meeting, and everyone will speak and come up with ideas. So that's one way of developing an innovative, innovative culture. Systemic thinking. Don't compartmentalize jobs, roles, departments, functions, subfunctions. So systemic thinking will give a holistic and a wider look at things by which people will learn to start putting each other into each other's shoes and come up with ideas which might not have occurred to the person who's in that role. Now, this typically works very well in the HR function. Recruitment, if it remains a separate compartment all the time, okay, recruitment will only look at closing positions, you know, getting, reducing the turnaround time. At some point of time, if they forget to look at what about the quality of hire? Now, is this person who's coming on board, well, he did come on board at the right time, but is he really going to add value to the business? So the recruitment team functions purely as a recruiter and not looking at the business overall. Innovation will not happen in that function. So if, you know, if we start breaking down these barriers and start taking holistic views, a culture of innovation can be brought about. Future thinking. Don't set KPIs only for a year. Don't set your targets only for a year. Think beyond, much beyond. In fact, one of the things that I do is I ask my team members, every one of them, to tell me what is likely to be their exit date from the organization. It's reality. Nobody is going to be there forever. But I want everyone to plan that with a view of developing a successor and making oneself redundant. When somebody says, I have overgrown my shoes here in this organization, and I want to do something else, I want to move on, I'll be the happiest one to go because it's not about retaining people for money, it's about developing competencies and creating leaders. So if you start thinking futuristically, the person is motivated to come up with innovative ideas, make them run, give it a name in the organization, and move on. Okay, that becomes a reward for whatever time and effort is invested on the person. And the simplest, is watch others. Do not shy away to look at what competitors are doing differently. And once you do that, learn to accept and acknowledge what people are doing differently and try to do something which is even better than that by using any of the techniques. I picked this table from a book called Permanent Innovation by L. Morris. I forget the first name, but the author's name is L. Morris. And this is from his book called uh, Permanent Innovation. That's quite a paradox in the name, but uh, that's what intrigued me. So this table talks about the typical behaviors in a status quo organization and the typical behavior in an innovation culture. A status quo organization is usually predictable. You know what comes next. Yes, it's time for the performance review, it's time for salary increase, it's time for this, it's time for that, it's time for festivals, it's time for drawing rangolis. Okay. But in an unpredictable organization, they are thinking about what to create next. In a status quo organization, stability. You know, people look for stability, people measure stability. In an innovation, innovative culture, 
people look for novelty, what's new, and they measure novelty. In a status quo organization, the focus is on core competencies, whereas in an innovative organization, the focus is on edge competency. How are you doing something, something better, something different from competition? Where is the cutting edge technology? A status quo organization will measure success, but an organization that has an innovative culture will also measure its failures because something that failed some time back may be giving birth to a new idea which will propel you up to success. In a status quo organization, hierarchy is feared because that's a typical organization structure. Whereas in an organization which has an innovative culture, the focus is on creative geniuses where there are no levels or designations from which ideas can come. Ideas can come from anyone. That's how an innovative culture will look like. A status quo organization is, likes to be in its zone of comfort. An innovative organization is usually risk taking. A status quo organization wants to do better every year by standardizing processes. And an innovative organization will want to do every year better by coming up with innovative ideas to standardize processes. That, would, that is what will give them the edge over the others. So typically how all these measurements are done is by looking at data which tells me that I'm doing fine. A status quo organization will always want a very, very healthy health report. Whereas an innovative organization will try to see what is it that is difficult for me, let me go and crack it. Okay, the last one is of course status quo loves certainty and an innovative organization embra embraces ambiguity. Right. And just uh, one last slide here is some of the do's and don'ts. So do let your imagination off the reins. If you want innovation to happen, imagination should run wild. But of course, one has to ensure that it's on track. Okay, that's what the champions will do. So no worries. Creative geniuses can go all over the place. The champions are here to ensure that you're not going uh, totally haywire and uh, also to ma maintain whatever discipline is required. Do branch out. Do, do things differently and do different things. And also do encourage innovation in the workplace. Everyone can play the role of an innovation leader and innovation champion if you're not the one who will come up with innovative ideas. So everyone is free to take the roles of innovation leader and innovation champion. What one should not do is don't be overconfident in your current strengths. Anybody can master those and take over. Don't ignore the competition and don't be overly cautious over costs. Again, the champions will take care that you're not doing something which is not profitable in the long run. But just putting cost as a constraint can kill innovation completely. So with that, thank you to everyone for staying awake. And uh, this is Harini signing off as a speaker from this side and over to you for any questions. Yes.